A people searching for their path. A world getting ever closer. A celebration of a miracle. Hopefully, it's also the beginning of something more exciting to come. World Insights Special on China at its 70th anniversary. Many faces and voices. A collective memory. A world in the making. Hello and welcome to Inside China, a special program marking the 70th anniversary of the PRC. I'm Tian Wei. 70 years of epic changes have taken place in this country. About this great transformation, let's listen to the stories of lives in China. They're from the people who have been witnessing, participating, and contributing to the unprecedented journey, no matter we are coming from China or elsewhere. Here are their stories and their versions of China. First, let's meet David Moser, an American who came to China in 1986 and has stayed in this country ever since. I met him 20 years ago. He was still fascinated by the many facets of life in China he experienced, which of course include bicycle stories. I will never forget the first day in Beijing. Um, I had always heard that Beijing was a world of bicycles, but I did not realize how it felt until I got here. And one of the first things they did to me was they said, uh, you can't live in China in Beijing. I was at Peking University. They said, you've got to have a bicycle. Here's one from the department. We loan it to you, you just, just ride it. So my first day in Beijing, I was riding a bicycle in that sea of bicycles. Mm. And it was the most terrifying moment of my life because there were people all around me. What was interesting to me, in America we have all different colors and sizes of bicycles. That's Back right. then they're all black and all the same size. And there was only a few brands. There was Feng Huang, Phoenix, uh -huh. Yongjiu, e e uh, Eternity, Forever. Forever. <laughs> and uh, I can't remember. Flying Pigeon. Flying Pigeon, Fake yeah. Huh. But they were all basically, you know, the same. So when I was at the Peking University cafeteria, I'd go in and eat and come out and there's this sea of bicycles and they all look exactly alike. Where's I look, my bike? I can't find my bike. <laughs> so what I would usually do is just walk back to the dorm and then I would come back two or three hours later and everyone had gone home and there would be my bike there in the middle. <laughs> That's how I find my bike in Beijing. It's very smart. Very smart, yeah. <laughs> You've been in many circles, shall I say. Right. Because you were one of those curious minds trying to learn Chinese traditional culture right. and crosstalk, which is a humorous dialogue. Mm -hmm performing in front of the public is one of those. Right. You were a student of the well-known master, mm -hmm. Ding Wang Chen. Chen right. yeah. You were also in the rock scene. Mm. You formed bands, you played four bands. Mm -hmm. At that time, many of the rock bands were underground. That's right, that's right. Including some of the biggest stars right. of rock, mm -hmm. if today you look at them. Right. You also were active in the academic circle uh -huh. because that has a lot to do with your research, That's right? That's right. I was in the universities, right? That's yeah. right. So you seem to have a taste of a lot of different entities mm -hmm. of China then. Right. Let's deal with them one by okay. one. Okay. What about the rock circle? Well, uh, of course, that was sort of the, the first you know, beginnings of Chinese rock and roll. And um, I was more of a jazz player. Yeah. But I remember... You were on keyboard. I was on keyboard. Although at that time I was playing trumpet. Okay. And uh, we went to a place that I'm sure people have forgotten about. Um, it's still there, but Maxime's. Maxime, Maxime, right? A French restaurant. A French restaurant. And there it they was one of the very few so-called foreign entity existed at all in, in Beijing. that time. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I had to someone told me that there was a uh, what they call a jam session where musicians get together and just play. Mm -hmm. And it was at that session that I met uh, Sui Jian for uh -huh. the first time. Because he actually was a jazz fan. And from that I learned, uh, uh, met his friends, like people like Liu Yuar, who uh -huh. plays his saxophone, who is also a jazz player. And those two worlds kind of, you know, blended together. 
So I found myself hanging out with all these rock musicians and jazz musicians, and it was very delightful because there was no sense of stars. We're all stars. You know, we don't pay any attention to these lower people, you know. They were very, very open to just learning from foreigners, having meetings, drinking together, playing music together. It was right. fantastic. <laughs> So it, was a, it was a great time. I think there was such a spirit of just cultural blending for the sheer joy of it. There was never ever a mention of money. Mm. Nobody cared about money. It was all about the culture. It was all about just the excitement of the music. Mm. It's a very I, we, I've often used the term for the 80s, romantic. Mm. It was a very romantic time. Mm. And people look back and look at the pictures of the 80s where everything was a lot more dirty and, and they're, you know, a little bit uh, grungy. But I said, this was, everyone was very romantic mm. at that time. For you who have been living with them, growing with them, what is it like? How would you describe these people, so-called legends in some of the eyes of many that are, mm -hmm. you know, looking up to them mm -hmm. and say, wow, these are you know, the founders and the, the godfather of Chinese <laughs> rock and roll, you know, those titles. I think probably nowadays, maybe a lot of young people don't really even know who these people are. They've gone, you know, on to, to different sorts of things. They're on the internet now. Mm. Uh, I think the special thing about that group, and I still like to, to, to be with them, is, is that although they were, they were these founders and, and they were very popular in their time and everything, they're always, in a certain way, very modest. Yeah. They never really thought that they were really, like the world's greatest musicians, or that they were just. They, they felt like they had to learn a lot. They were very serious about it. They felt that they had limitations because they hadn't grown up with this music. They were still learning it, and I think they still have. Even Sui Jian has a certain amount of very, very admirable modesty mm. about his own music. He still feels like he, he struggles to make music, and, right. it's, and he's very serious about it. I think that's a, a kind of spirit that you sometimes don't see among some of the younger stars where you know they have their publicity agents that put them everywhere and they feel like you know and it's and plus it's, <laughs> it's a lot easier to make music now because it's all electronic right. you can sing off key and they'll fix yeah. it back then it was like the real what they call gung fu mm -hmm. you had to really sing really play the guitar otherwise it wouldn't work yeah. and so it's live every time it's of live course. every time yeah, yeah. right But that is only music, yeah. right? You also got to know the crosstalk cross circle. Yeah. I was looking for some, some more interesting Chinese to help me learn, my, learn Chinese language yes. better. Yeah. And the textbooks back then, are, you can't imagine how boring they were. <laughs> Unbelievably boring textbooks. I wanted something that was real, interesting, and funny. And when I heard, first heard crosstalk on the radio, you know, I said, what is this? Mm. I said, oh, it's this thing called Xiangsheng, you know, do you like it? Yes, where can I get it? Where can mm. I buy it? So people gave me some, some tapes and I began to listen. When I was at Peking University, I was fortunate enough to meet a great professor who's no longer with us, or someone named Wang Jingshou, who was an expert on crosstalk and Xuyi and knew mm. all the masters. And he was so friendly to me, gave me materials, let me interview people. That's how I met people like Ma Ji and Jiang Kun and all these people. He introduced th them to me. And so I was just thinking of doing it as an academic. I mean, how could I possibly perform this thing? Yeah, it's very difficult. Eventually you did. Eventually I did, again, through Wang Jingshou, after my writing this thesis, and there was already Da Shan, the famous Canadian, right? Yeah. And my f professor said, he said, uh, Dao Wei, your Chinese is good enough, you, you can do this too. And so he recommended me some people. <laughs> so I, I couldn't believe it. Here I was, a nerd with the glasses, you know, a nerd. <laughs> kind of thing. And I'm supposed to go on, on the stage yeah. on TV and do Xiangsheng. And everybody crazy. applauded and laughed. I think they laughed for maybe other reasons than <laughs> the, the jokes. For the clumsiness the of jokes, the joke. Exactly. Yeah. But, but anyway, uh, and, so, and that's how I met my final, my master, Ding Wang Chan, mm -hmm. who's also no longer with us who was one of the greatest, most wonderful people in the world. And I've really, I cherish the time I spent with him. He was also Dashan's teacher. Mm -hmm. And the world of crosstalk for foreigners, many of whom have gone on TV to do this, 
is a wonderful window into Chinese culture at all levels. The right. humor, the history, the arts, the singing, the operas, the regional dialects. So much Chinese history in those pieces. And the transformation of jokes through ages. Exactly, exactly. So I, it, it was a pleasure and honor and just an unbelievable opportunity mm -hmm. to be a part of that scene and meet those people. It was amazing. Hey, please, please, <laughs> Despite of the fact China has opened up its door 40 years ago to the rest of the world, there's still an evolving necessity of understanding China. Right. I guess the other way around as well. Mm -hmm. But if somebody asks you, so David, after there, 35 years, what is China? Back then, Deng Xiaoping said it very, very well. He said, "Let's bide our time and, and wait." Tao Guang Yang Hui, right? Um, now, I think the difference now is that we, China, has waited. It has grown, and now is the time. It's no longer time to hold back. Now they're they're ex exerting themselves out in the world, right? So I think it's a country that has been developing, waiting, learning for a very long time. And now is a crucial moment where it's now stepping out into the world and actually actively doing things instead of just absorbing from the West completely now. So that time is completely over and that's where we are now and that's what we're studying. That's what we want to learn. What's the next stage? among the Chinese themselves. As a researcher on China, he is trying to tell China stories through the eyes of the life of expats in the early days. I came in 95, I went straight, almost straight into Beijing University <laughs> and that was my advantage because uh, before that I had already studied uh, the Chinese language. Uh, for three years I was in Taiwan, so that was more than, than uh, 30 years ago. Mm. I started in 1988. So when you came here, you studied with one of the most well-known philosophers from China today. Professor Tang Yijie. Yes, I learned from him uh, his openness. He was a very tolerant and very open person. Uh, uh, and uh, I did my uh, PhD under his uh, supervision. Yeah, and he is an expert of, of Taoism, mm -hmm. but also Confucianism. Yeah, so he tried to see the whole uh, Chinese uh, tradition, but also he was very open to the West. Uh, for example, he also uh, mentioned in one of his books, he writes about um, the first Western Sinologist who came mm. to China 400 years ago, that was Matteo Ricci, yeah, right. an Italian. Yeah. And so he thought what, what Matteo Ricci actually brought to China, what was new there. Yeah. So Matteo Ricci was not only the one who brought Western science to China, for example, he translated the Jiha Yuanban, it's about geometry, but also he translated the Confucianist classics uh, into Latin. Is there one example that you can give us that you've been trying quite hard to get across to the other culture about China in the Chinese philosophy or tradition that you think is important for China today? I was try, uh, trying to about what Confucius could have meant by Junzi and mm -hmm. Xiaoren. Mm -hmm. yeah. For me it matters because I think many Chinese people throughout history or even up to now, they try to uh, emulate or imitate this uh, model of the Junzi. He's a person uh, who is very human. Uh, he has Ren, he has justice, Ren Yi Li Zhi. Yeah. Uh, but what I like very much is uh, that uh, Confucius says he is happy with very simple food mm. and a bad uh, uh, living quarters. It is actually the Tao or meditation of spiritual things that are more interesting, more life-giving. Yeah? There have been a lot of new ideas coming into China. 
Yes. And that course. has been the nature of interaction between China and the rest of the world? For example, 100 years ago, they said Sai Xianzheng and De Xianzheng. Yes. Yeah? Now, Sai Xianzheng. Mr. Democracy and, and Mr. Science. Science. Yes, mm. yes. Those were doing the May the Force movement, of course. Yes. There was a great movement for education. Huh? Uh, I admire very much our former uh, rector of our university, is the, uh, Wu Yujiang. Yeah, he tried to uh, change the Chinese characters, the old, the, the difficult Chinese characters. He actually wanted to give up the characters and promote an ABC. So uh -huh. uh, Latin ABC instead of the tradition of the, of the characters. And of course they didn't succeed because elite, eventually China has adopted a simplified, simplified characters. characters. Yeah. Yes. But the pinyin today is used for all messages and all things. That's right. So for example, this is one example how uh, the Chinese people as a whole, they work now uh, much more with ABC than before. How do you think the past 70 years has transformed or shaped or changed the Chinese culture in your eyes? In my eyes, uh, the past 70 years have done a lot to open up the Chinese mind uh, to Western, uh, to the world. Marxism came in, but it was a whole new language and a whole new worldview. Uh, mm -hmm. So many new ideas and uh, these ideas, uh, for example, the idea of society, yeah? we, we talk about socialism, yeah? so the society is all of those people, including the poor people, including the workers, uh, so it is, it is a, new, a new idea of society. Uh, I often tell my students, you know, where the word society comes from, you use it every day, shehui, yeah, or shehui jui, uh, but uh, the word society comes from the Latin word socius, yeah? and socius means actually friend, is friendship. Yeah? So the society is made up of friends, yeah? um, of partners who work together in society. our special program for the 70th anniversary of the PRC. Both David and Leopold, whom we met earlier in the show, have fascinating stories to tell, but also insights into the minds of generations of Chinese. I asked them to share some of their takes on that in our Nostalgia studio. Here is our conversation. David Moser and Leopold Leib. What a pleasure to see both of you here. And even on the table, we have some food coupons and grain rations. Yes, I, these were very familiar to me. I remember the first time in the street, I wanted to just go buy some mantou. Uh -huh. And I pulled out my money. The and Chinese they went, bread. <laughs> and they went, no, your money is no good. Mm -hmm. said, what? Mm -hmm. I had to use these grain rations. You had to go with the money in right. order to get, because everything was limited at that right. time. But I had one experience with the Wai Hui Chen. Uh, at that time, the foreigners used a different kind of currency. Uh, so the very first time I came to Beijing was in, in 91, yeah. and of course I wanted to go to see the Forbidden City, to the Gugong, and they said, oh, for foreigners it is 20 Wai Hui Chuan, and for Chinese it is 2, two Yuan. So <laughs> I, was, I was very angry at the difference, at the high difference. Ten times different, different, yeah. different uh, <laughs> entrance fees, yeah. But later on I was very happy, then it all was equalized, yeah. yeah. Now today there is of course no difference in these respects. No, but you know, when you could even talk about this, the younger generations of Chinese could have a hard time understanding what is really going on here. That's true, yeah. Um, a lot of the things I lived through, and then of course you in the 90s, for the, for the, the post-90s generation, especially in the new ones, this was not their life. They, they grew up in a very different China. They have no idea what's mm -hmm. happening. They may know the latest uh, uh, Game of Thrones episode, or they may House know of Cards. House of Cards, <laughs> or the latest uh, some clothing or tennis shoes or something. Mm -hmm. But if you just say something like uh, Mian Di, uh -huh. the old taxi cabs, the the, the bread box trucks uh, that, that that were death traps, <laughs> 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 uh, 
they have no idea what you're talking mm -hmm. about because they've grown up in a world where taxis are, you know, modern, convenient, air-conditioned vehicles. So. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mian Di have long gong. Long gong, yeah. yeah. See, and good riddance. Uh, th they were not the most pleasant of. <laughs> <laughs> but very unique the of very the unique generation. Bit, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, whether there is such a huge generational gap when it comes to collecting memories, that's an interesting topic, isn't it? That I mean what David just said, that they might know more about what's going on in the West now mm -hmm. than in their own history 20 and 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting observation, I have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, certainly I've had conversations with taxi cab drivers uh, recently where they asked me something about the price of cars or they mm -hmm. asked me about the, the latest uh, NBA national basketball stars. And I have to say, you know, I have I no idea. I'm sorry, I have no idea. They say, but you're American. You should know these things. Yeah. You know better than I do because you want, you have the internet. Mm. And you're able to find these things. Mm. So, so it's not just a matter of knowing, you know, uh, the, the the past and the and the present. Yeah. It's it's they have access to everything from overseas. They don't need us anymore as sort of these magical uh, communicators of hidden knowledge. Yeah. They've got it all in front of their <laughs> on the internet. If you think about the Chinese, over the past 30, 40 years, things are changing so fast that as you argued both earlier, even some of the Chinese are having a difficult time catching up with what has really happened. Mm -hmm. But here we are in an interesting demonstration of at least glimpse of history of a Chinese household. Mm -hmm. And that gives us another interesting question. How do you see the rising feeling of being nostalgia in the Chinese society? What does that say to you about how the Chinese are looking at themselves and probably as a way, an entry point about their future? Mm -hmm. David? I, th I think that is a good point. I, do ha I have noticed that myself with some pleasure. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. When I came here in the 80s and I think through the 90s, uh, looking back on it, that was such a fr frantic, almost frenetic time when, when people were, were almost desperate to like go outward. They were like looking outward and, and forward into the future, very forward, you know, uh, focused. Mm -hmm. so they were interested in getting a good degree. They were interested in what the next mm -hmm. big thing was. They were mm -hmm. interested in pulling China to the next mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And they, they got so uh, focused on this trajectory of forward and more and up mm -hmm. that they almost didn't think reflect at all on what had just happened and what had just been. Mm -hmm. Now you turn on the TV and you mm -hmm. see TV series, you see shows that are reflecting back to the 80s mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. stories of the people the people who first took the Gao Kao and then began to, you know, mm, yeah. you see these 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 dancers, you these these TV show series that that go back to this nostalgic period, that go back to the 90s, mm. even documentaries that that go back and explore those times. Mm. And I think th it, this is a good time for China to some people to slow down, stop a little bit, and and look back on where we've come from, mm. and then assess that in terms of where, where we're going mm. now. They say looking back sometimes could give you strength, but sometimes would give you even more questions. What do you think? Yeah, you used the word nostalgia. That's a very strange word because uh -huh. it's the Greek algia. Al algia is, is pain. pain you, yeah. know? you see something old and actually you feel pain. Huh? Mm. And I would I associate with that what Chinese people maybe early, maybe in the 80s, mm -hmm. yeah, they said, we just want to get rid of our past. Yeah? So yes, yes. The mm -hmm. Jiu yeah, right, right. Has, has to disappear and we, we just look ahead. But today I think it's more objective. I live in Beijing, obviously. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how many Beijingers have told me things like, uh, you know, oh, we were so much more polite in those old days. Yeah, Some yeah, of the ties yeah. between neighbors were yes, much better. Yes, yes, uh, the yes, way yes. we lived, we always helped each other out. We never locked our doors. Never locked the you doors, don't go yes. back to this earlier time. Mm -hmm. You think mm -hmm. uh, it's great now to have all these great refrigerators mm -hmm. and air conditioning mm -hmm. and cell phones and stuff, mm -hmm. but you lose, you lose something of the contact. Mm -hmm. I think it's go back just to see that and see what kinds of of human things we've, mm. we've lost, which is why, you know, this is go, go back to reading books, mm. go back to, uh, mm. you know, uh, playing games with the, yeah. with the, in, the, in the yard with the kids and mm. stuff. Mm. So, I mean, it's good for that to see what's valuable and what's, what's valuable the, about the past and what's mm. valuable what we have now. Mm. Mm. And what you mentioned before, how to build up society, society's consideration for right. the other, yeah? but if everybody's in his own world, very individualistic, yeah, exactly. then you cannot build up uh, concern for others. Yeah? Mm. And so maybe 
the last years have people made become more selfish actually not actually more um, charitable or, or mm -hmm. concerned about others so that is, I have my doubts I have a German friend he says there's no real progress in world history oh we are so proud of our progress we are always better than the past but he says you know there is no real progress we think the hand is a very uh, wonderful <laughs> tool but we lost so many things mm -hmm. uh, um, very interesting. He's a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> we have two philosophers and historians sitting with us uh, today. But certainly it's wonderful to be able to use this opportunity at least to reflect back a little upon what we had experienced. Yes. And possibly that could give us even some hints about what kind of future we mm -hmm. could embrace. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Gates Foundation probably can be described as one of the best or most sophisticated <laughs> about the realities and China experiences no. in the world. Oh, no, absolutely. But still, there is a lot of space yeah. for improvement, it no. seems. Absolutely. Yeah, as you remember, I was asking, uh, one of our colleagues was asking uh, Bill Gates because, you know, Bill is probably the individual that's the most optimistic and, you know, has a balanced view on China. Um, and I was remembering when one time when he was here, one of our colleagues asked him, said, you know, Bill, like, how, how come you're so good in understanding of China, right? And his answer, I still remember, he said, you know, it's not because I'm so good, it's because the average is too low. <laughs> Like the average Americans know too little. Like I, my, my understanding is very basic. <laughs> you it know. sounds so much like Bill. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You think like you know, as, as long as you care to mm. look online mm. and get some real data and look into any publication, you will know. But mm. many people don't, you know, care to do that. Right. As you may know very well, you work on this every day. China become much more eye-catching in the world. <laughs> right. In different yeah. ways, of yeah. course. Yeah. And therefore, there's a huge amount of explanation yeah. and communication that needs to be done. Yeah. But maybe the speed of that will not be able to catch up mm -hmm. with how perceptions are being formed right. on the other end of the line. But yeah. you know, you know what, here's the reality that China has to face. Maybe in front of many misunderstandings, that's how you have to still go to the next step, yeah. even with all the misunderstandings. Yeah. When I started, I was mostly frustrated, as you say, you know, because you feel people, oh, why, why don't you understand me? Yeah. Like, why didn't you get the fact? I guess that's the first phase. And second phase is a bit of more sort of at peace and realizing that we all, each individual, have our own sets of limits, right? Because we form an opinion based on the sets of facts that surrounding us mm -hmm. or we have access to. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third phase is getting to say, okay, then what can we do about it, right? Actually, everybody can do something when you are telling your own story. Um, and exactly to your point, because perception, frankly, is sometimes the reality, unfortunately. Mm. So, you know, it's almost the mindset wise you have to change. I have to create or support certain perception mm. to be created as long as those are, you know, a real reflection of the truth. Because if you don't do that, somebody else will. Yes. <laughs> so, the, you know, the space is there to be filled. And then if they do it in the wrong way, you'll end up taking all the consequences anyway. So you're better mm. off to be more proactive and do that. Why would the Chinese always want to be faster, <laughs> you know, better, yeah. uh, earning more money, yeah. uh, be able to get even when it comes to world ranking yeah. further yeah. advanced? Yeah. Why is it important to the Chinese? Yeah. Don't they want to rest a little bit? Don't they want to go to the beaches? And <laughs> don't they want to enjoy themselves? Don't yeah. they have some family life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, I heard that a lot. But I think there are a few uh, interesting takes I will take. First of all, I think, you know, it's a universal, I guess if you look at the development of human society, any mm -hmm. society, there are two key um, um, themes like everybody's after, I think. One is development. Everybody wants to get better. And one is uh, equity. I, I, everybody wanted to reduce the gap, right? I think on exactly these two fronts, in the way China has um, suffered quite a bit, right? So I guess I often say, like, you know, probably our generation, like my grandma's um, generation, mm -hmm. right? So they're, you know, I remember she has like 10 siblings. Wow. You know, she, so her mom gave birth to 13 kids. Wow. And only three survived. Mm -hmm. And that's very common around that time. Um, so, like, you know, having that in your own family is actually pretty profound. And saying that how much we've traveled from that time, I think that gave a lot of people a lot of inspiration that m much can be done. Yes. And if that's possible, then, you know, our generation ought to do better, right? A lot of can-do spirit. Exactly, really. yeah. exactly. So I think, in a way, it's really a tribute to, you know, what you know, China has gone through over the last century. Mm. If somebody just asks you randomly, you know, what is China like? Mm. Mm. What would you say? I'll use analogy. Okay. I think China is like a growing teenager. <laughs> I think that's probably best. It has to be a teenager. Exactly. I got it. <laughs> it best explains everything. You know, I guess the one, one why it's interesting in teenager, because if you are a boy, by the time you are 15 or 16, you're probably like a 180 meter tall, right? So then, so then people will assume, since you are so tall, so strong, you know, you'll know your stuff. But inside, you're a teenager, you know? So I think that's, that's, that's really how I think, because people would expect, oh, now you're the second largest economy. But, you know, China, even like a very short period ago, was actually a pretty poor kid, like nobody cares about, right? right? 
Um, so that's why China needs quite some help. I think the help not only from um, partners like externally who kind of see China in that positive teenager growing light, but also for ourselves in terms of how do we tell that story? How do we become less awkward? awkward mm. right? How do we become you know, understanding what are the global expectations? Mm. Because I think it's only a positive thing when it becomes a mature man right, or mature woman. forward from the early days of reform and opening up, the post-1980s and 90s generations from China many argue are experiencing a totally different set of challenges and have very different aspirations. As they are mostly the only child in a family, they have both the pressure and the luxury to be successful in their own ways. So what does that mean to them? Well, May and Zhishuan joined me and explained, but we managed to have some fun before the rather serious discussion. Earlier, we've been talking to you know those who came to China in the 1980s and 90s, and those coming from the 70s generation. We have. From the 80th generation. Yeah, the millennial. Le <laughs> Mei, <laughs> and also uh, we have Zhu Xuan coming from the 90th generation. He wants to emphasize he was born in the 1990. year 1990. Yes, what a historical year. <laughs> <laughs> they were saying earlier in our conversation that your generations are very different from theirs because you guys enjoy all the benefits of China's development. And it seems that you're still not satisfied, according to them. Mm. We, we more care about uh, our dreams, what is the meaning of our own lives. We think about uh, our more huge topics, like climate change, like uh, people's uh, equal people and women. Uh, women gender equity. Yeah, gender equity, topic like this. So maybe from their 16th and 17th, they were more take care about their uh, foods and uh, uh, place to live? Post-80s generation? Oh, I think post-80s mostly in between, uh -huh. which means, yes, we have feel some benefits from the uh, economies booming, and then we have good education, and then we have more opportunity to go overseas uh -huh. to see the world, and also we also bear the stress from the society, and we, because for us, we are the first generation to be the single child in family. That's so true. all the focus from the grandparents and to our parents, they dedicate their time, their energy, their wealth in our grow up, which means we, we have more pressure to, to give back. What about that? You know, the previous generation could sometimes just whole life, one job. For you, five already. Yeah. For you, Already to start up already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you make of that life choices? I would want to add comments on the on the on the thing that we you talked before about the parents' pressures. Uh -huh. Maybe because we only we are the only one in the family, so we have lots of focus, and uh, they were ask us to do. You should get married in 28. You should find a job in a um, uh, SOE. You should you shouldn't change the job. You shouldn't go to the ma majority of the opinion is you shouldn't do that. You should follow the majority part. And uh, but for for us that we do what the mainstream is we doing. Yeah, we but we we don't want to do the mainstreams. We want to be different. We want the gut feeling. The gut feeling is we want to do something different. And uh, it's not only about wealthy, about money. It is about you be yourself. Mm. Because my job will also help people, help other uh, entrepreneurs to fund to financing. So I uh, I know the small and medium sized small and companies, medium -sized companies mm. different uh, industries, and not only in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. Some of them are in uh, we call it second line cities. They uh, they have the same. They share the same. Even we come from different uh, education background. Mm. We have the different families. But in this point, the the young generations, people like me. Oh, young, younger than me. Mm. This is their first choice when they graduate. But it's just uh, for for themselves, mm. yeah, for their to fulfill their own dreams. Yeah, yeah. Much more than 
to fulfill their parents' dreams. Uh, you know, we are talking to one another on the eve of the 70th anniversary of the PRC. Well, I guess we only experienced part of it, the three of us. But when you think about it, if people ask you, hmm, so what is China? Because there are more people extremely interested and curious about China. In the past 10 years, I go travel overseas. And in the beginning, when I went to Europe, people will, and they be, maybe have some talk on the train, and people think, oh, oh, where are you come from? China. Oh, I know Forbidden City. I know Panda. Mm -hmm. and, but maybe not so many people visit. But later then, also the same talk or similar talk, and they oh, I, I've been there. Oh, it's really fantasy. Oh, I have good food there. Mm -hmm. I, I think I speak out the China voice to, to the global, to, from business level to influence our business strategy uh, from global to China. But I think for personal level, it's a good experience to uh, have an equal voice from, uh, from China and from other rest mm -hmm. countries and also with the key strategy team. Omei and Zhishuan, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your personal stories with all of our audience from all over the world. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Happy you, holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Mm -hmm.